Greek New Testament sentence diagramming. This is part two of our little how-to series. Let's start with some review. I'll quickly pass through material that we covered in part one. A sentence diagram is a grammatical map of the sentence. Its key components are baselines, uh, consisting of the kernel elements of subject, verb, and object. Here's an example. Uh, modifiers hang on shelves below the word they modify, as shown right here. Branches show a coordinate series of items. And obviously, that's the example of a branch. And then the stilt that shows an element that's too complex to fit in a simple slot uh, is exemplified right here. All right. The key to sentence diagramming is, like it or not, knowledge of grammar. Grammar really doesn't need to be as intimidating as a lot of people think. If, if we get it down to its basic building blocks, I think you'll find it to prove uh, quite manageable. What are those building blocks? Well, there's a kernel of each clause. That's the core of the clause, consisting of subject, verb, and any complement that may be present. There are modifiers to various elements within the kernel or to other modifiers. And then sometimes you have items in a series, parallel items. Remember the importance of these who and what questions. After you've identified the verb of a kernel, you phrase a question with the word who or what before the verb to lead you to finding the subject of the verb. And you phrase the who or what question after the verb to lead you to find the complement. Now, you might say this is really unnecessary because in English, um, the word order tells us what the subject and what the complement are. We don't have to look for them. Well, remember, this is Greek New Testament sentence diagramming. You say, yeah, that's one of the things that puzzles me here. You're advertising Greek New Testament sentence diagramming, but I haven't seen a word of Greek yet. Well, we're just trying to get into the diagramming aspect of things, which I think we can do most easily if we can focus on that element without the barrier of the foreign language intervening. So for right now, we're looking at English. Uh, but we will be looking at Greek starting with part three. And in the Greek word order, you know there's a great deal more flexibility than English has, and so sometimes you do have to look around to find the words that answer these who or what questions that provide the subject and the complement of the verb. All right then, let's move on now and talk about the idea of sentence diagramming these building blocks of a sentence illustrated as a jigsaw puzzle. So here is a rather rudimentary jigsaw puzzle piece. And we're going to talk first about the kernel of a clause. And so that piece, as I've drawn it, would represent the verb. And you notice it has two connecting points. On the left and on the right are connecting points. And you're going to be looking for sentence elements that fit those connecting points, just like jigsaw puzzle pieces fit together. Well, not just like, because we're not talking about literal physical fit. But remember those who or what questions. The who or what question to identify the subject is kind of like this circular part uh, of the puzzle piece here, we're looking for something that fits the who or what question before the verb. When we're looking for the complement, we're looking for a who or what question after the verb. I've given a different shape here because the subject-verb connection is logically, uh, grammatically, a different kind of connection than the verb-complement connection is. Since we've got two different kinds of connections, I'm giving two different shapes in the puzzle piece here. So we're looking for a complement connection on this side of the verb, a subject connection on this side of the verb. So I think you can pretty well guess what's coming next now visually in the presentation. A subject goes on the left of the verb with a protrusion that fits into the socket, so to speak, on the verb. I made things the other way around. Perhaps I should have put a square shaped socket on the verb and given the protrusion to the complement uh, so that uh, things would fit together that way. The verb would have these sockets and both subject and complement would plug into those sockets. But either way, there's the idea of a conceptual fitness. The pieces need to fit together and the complement fits logically after the verb. There is a logical order to these things. Uh, the verb is the central idea of the clause and every verb has to have a subject. A verb expresses an action or a state of being. You cannot have an action independent of an actor. You cannot have a state of being independent of something to exist in that state. So every verb has to have a subject, at least logically. It's not always expressed in the sentence, but it has to exist at least logically, and very often it is expressed in the sentence. Not every verb has a complement, and so that's a different kind of connection. Uh, the subject and verb are the necessary things to express a complete thought. Uh, I haven't used these terms in part one, but it's time to use them now. A complete thought consists of a subject and a predicate. The subject is the topic about which the statement is made, and the predicate is the statement made about the topic. Or if it's an interrogative type statement, then uh, you have a question asked about the subject. Those are the basic two parts of any proposition. 
So you have to have both of those parts in order to have a complete thought. That means you have to have a subject and a verb in order to have a complete thought. Not all verbs take complements. And so sometimes a complement is not necessary. Uh, when it is necessary, uh, it fits in a way that we can identify by the who or what question phrased after the verb. Okay, now I've got a kind of a bold horizontal line here. That's just a visual separator on the page. Uh, this is the other major uh, thought connection we talked about. Um, a modifier uh, gives more information about the head word. So I've given a different shape, uh, a kind of a triangular shape uh, connection to make this one look a little different from these. So uh, a modifier isn't going to fit as the subject of a verb. Uh, the subject is not going to fit as modifying the head word. We're, we're looking for conceptual fitness as we build our understanding of the grammar of a sentence. All right, and then a grammatical relationship that we did not talk about in part one is that between preposition and object, such as in the box. In is the preposition, the box is the object, and the reason I've used a rectangular connector between these two is because the object is answering a who or what question like the complement of a verb does. Uh, maybe the most common kind of complement to a verb is the direct object. Well, prepositions also have objects, and they're like objects of verbs in that they answer the question who or what. So a prepositional phrase in the box, if you take the object of the preposition away, you're left with the word in. You know, please put the ball in. And if the sentence stops right there, the person's going to say, put the ball in what? We need an answer to the who or what question after that preposition. So this is another kind of grammatical relationship we need to expand our understanding now to take in so that we can advance a little bit further here in part two beyond where we got in part one. Okay, so let's go back to examples that we use. Jesus healed the man. And let's put this together as a jigsaw puzzle. What piece do you think this is? If you remember what the puzzle looked like on the last screen, you know that this is the verb piece. Okay, so which word in our example, Jesus healed the man, is the verb? Well, which word expresses the action? Obviously, healed. Okay, now let me give you a moment to think and formulate in your mind the who or what question that will lead you to the subject. Now, don't just tell me in, in, in your mind what word is the subject. Think of the question that leads to the subject. This is a very simple example, so the subject is obvious. But we're going to learn to deal with complicated examples where the subject is not so obvious, and we have to ask the right questions to find the subject. So get the question in your mind. What is the question that will lead us to the subject? Well, it's who or what healed. And the answer, of course, is that Jesus healed. And then what's the other part of the kernel that we may need to consider, whether it's present or not? Uh, that's the complement. How would we identify the complement? If there is a complement, it's going to answer the who or what question after the verb. So Jesus healed who or what? Jesus healed the man. And so uh, there you have uh, the man fitting into the grammar as the complement of the verb, the direct object more specifically. All right, let's look at another example where we expand just a little bit. Instead of Jesus healed the man, now it's Jesus healed the blind man. Uh, we used this example in part one as well. Can you visualize where the word blind is going to go in this little jigsaw puzzle and what the shape of the connector is going to be based on what we've already talked about in this video? Well, if you're envisioning it under the word man with a little triangle shape protrusion, you got it right. Blind is giving us more information about which man Jesus healed. Okay, here's another one. Jesus healed on the Sabbath. We didn't talk about this one, I don't think, in part one. Healed, again, is our verb. Uh, Jesus is the subject, just like the previous example. But something is different the way I've drawn this. You spot the difference this time. If you're noticing the absence of the rectangular protrusion on the verb piece, uh, then you're thinking correctly. Yeah, something's missing there. Uh, did I do that wrong? Or... Do you know what I'm doing, or are you puzzled? If you're puzzled, as I know from teaching experience many students would be, let's work through that puzzlement. Students tend to think that I should have done it like this. Jesus healed. Okay, after healed comes what? On the Sabbath. And I don't have a full subject verb complement yet. So after I say Jesus healed, the thing that comes next must be part of the kernel and therefore goes in the complement slot. And so students will want to diagram it like this, with on the Sabbath as the complement for the verb. But uh-uh, 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 don't do that. Why not? If you thought that's where it should go, you need to stop and think, as we're working through the video here, where did I go wrong? 
And I hope by now you've picked up on a recollection that there's a who or what question that the complement of the verb has to answer. So let me ask you, does on the Sabbath answer the question who or what Jesus healed? Absolutely not. If it doesn't answer the who or what question after the verb, it is not the complement. So we need to ditch that and we need to get the prepositional phrase on the Sabbath in the right location. Do you know where it should go now? If it's not part of the kernel, it must be a modifier, most likely. Does it give us more information about Jesus? You know, which Jesus healed? Well, the Jesus on the Sabbath healed. No, that doesn't work. Does it give us more information about healed? Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Oh, yeah, that works. It tells us when he healed. Beautiful. That's where we'll place it then, as a modifier under the verb healed. All right, if you had that right from the beginning, you're doing great. Keep it up. Now, a little fuller expression to conflate the two examples we've been working with. How about Jesus healed the blind man? on the Sabbath. All right, this is how it would look. We've already seen blind as modifying man. We've already seen on the Sabbath modifying healed. So all we have to do now is put this together. And I want to ask you if you notice what I have done here. And if you can think about why I have done that. You notice those two puzzle pieces do not touch each other. So this isn't a real jigsaw puzzle, is it? Because in a real jigsaw puzzle, you can't have gaps between the pieces like that. Why did I leave a gap between those pieces? Well, the answer is because those pieces do not relate to one another. I could put them together with straight lines, just so it looks nice and neat and blockish in appearance, but I decided that I wanted to separate them to emphasize the fact uh, and not create any confusion about whether on the Sabbath and blind somehow relate to each other. No, but remember the connections within grammatical constructions tend to be binary. That means there are just two things that connect in the way we're considering. So on the Sabbath is a modifier for the word healed. That's all it does. Those two are connected. Blind is a modifier for the word man. That's all it does. Those two are connected. On the Sabbath does not connect to blind. Blind does not connect to on the Sabbath. So I wanted to put a break in there to separate those out. Even though, as I say, now it doesn't look so much like a jigsaw puzzle. I'm really not trying to say a sentence diagram is completely like a jigsaw puzzle in every way. I'm only trying to use that analogy to talk about the fitness of one part of a sentence with the other part of a sentence so that they interlock and join in this kind of binary relationship uh, that I've been speaking of in these videos. All right, one more sentence, uh, quite a different one in terms of content. The Son of Man will conquer his enemies on the last day. So here's a square in the middle. What goes there? Well, the verb goes there, right? Which word is the verb? I hope that you can identify a future tense verb, will conquer, uh, as the verb of this sentence. So we'll put this here. Uh, now, we know it has to have a subject. So who or what will conquer? And maybe you're inclined to say son of man. Well, I'll grant you some credit there. Uh, let's just go with son right now. We'll come back to the of man in a moment. But the son will conquer. If we're just looking for the minimal subject, the son will conquer. Now, we need to test to see whether we have a complement. What's the question that will lead us to a complement if it's there? The who or what question. So the son of man will conquer who or what? You say, ah, I can get that one. The son of man will conquer his enemies. Well, again, I'll grant you that you're on the right track. But again, I think you've added a little too much information. Uh, the Son of Man will conquer enemies, that's the object, but his is a modifier for the word enemies. So we want to put his not right with the word enemies in the same block. We want to account for the grammatical relationship between his and enemies, where his is the modifier. And now we know what to do with the phrase of man, same thing, of man is a modifier for the word son. So we'll diagram it uh, as so. Now, what are we going to do with the part of the sentence that's left? The Son of Man will conquer his enemies on the last day. Well, obviously that tells when he will conquer, doesn't it? So this is a modifier on the last day is an adverbial modifier for will conquer. So I'm putting on the day here. What about the word last? Well, that's a modifier telling which day, right? But the way I have this diagram, how do I make that modifier modify only the word day? You know, instead of connecting it up with the triangle in the center, I could bring the triangle under the word day, maybe make a little dotted line up to the word day or something like that uh, to make clear that last is only modifying the word day. It doesn't modify the word on at all. Uh, it's only telling us about the word day. So it's not really modifying the whole prepositional phrase. It's only modifying that one noun, day. 
So uh, how do I show that? Well, before we try to answer that question, let's think about this as well. There's another grammatical relationship here that isn't shown as I have this diagram. I'm treating on today as an adverbial unit modifying will conquer. That's true. But within that clause on the day, there's a preposition object relation. So can we diagram in a way that will show that connection? The preposition relates to its object uh, in a certain grammatical way. So uh, yeah, let's get rid of uh, on the day and uh, let's redo it this way. Now I have one big block containing the words on the day and it has the little triangle protrusion uh, that connects it as a modifier to the verb will conquer. But now I've given it this little rectangular protrusion so that we can see that on has an object, the noun day with its article. And so now we have the prepositional phrase functioning as a modifier for the verb with the preposition object relation shown. And now I have separated off the word day in such a manner as I can bring in my modifier last in a way that clearly connects it only with the word day. So I think this would be the best way for us to accomplish what we're trying to do here. Okay, if you can follow all that, then you're doing a pretty good job with mastering the building blocks of grammar. If you don't follow all that yet, rewind, hit it again, I think another time or two, and some things will click and it will make sense. So uh, let's take a sneak peek as to what is coming here. And in part three, we're gonna move beyond this jigsaw puzzle illustration into actual sentence diagrams. And just to give you an example, if we take that same sentence, the Son of Man will conquer his enemies on the last day. Uh, and here's the jigsaw puzzle we drew for that. Here's what that would look like in sentence diagram form. And you're welcome to pause the video and study that for a little while, but I won't make any further comments. I'll just say, see you next time.